good morning and welcome to God's house and to the worship of our great God and King. I have a few announcements that I need to make, please. Um, if you're part of the Vision Committee, uh, we will um, be meeting tomorrow night at 5.30 and uh, supper will be provided. Uh, also, our last uh, grief share uh, is this Tuesday night, and I want to take a minute and thank uh, the ladies that have uh, come forward and done the, um, the, the, the food, the snacks for, uh, for that time. That has been hugely helpful to us as we carried out Grief Share. Uh, we've had as many as eight or nine uh, there uh, on certain nights, and so... <clears throat> and have averaged at least, I think, six or seven. And so it's such a meaningful and necessary uh, ministry. We'll do that again, and uh, I just really appreciate uh, the women stepping up and, and doing that. Uh, Thursday is not only men's and women's Bible study, uh, but Thursday at uh, 12 noon, uh, for those that don't want to be at Bible study, it is a national day of prayer at the courthouse, um, actually in the courtroom back again this time uh, after a couple of years uh, being away. And so that is Thursday at 12 noon as well. And finally, uh, well, two things. Uh, the deacons will not meet next week as it's Mother's Day, uh, but will meet on May 22nd. And next uh, 15th is women, uh, the min women's ministry meeting on Sunday, May 15th in two weeks. I think that's all of the uh, announcements that we have. Our call to worship uh, this morning comes from John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd, says the Lord. I know my own, and my own know me. Let's pray together. God of all power, you have called from death our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Send us as shepherds to rescue the lost, to heal the injured, and to feed the one another with knowledge and understanding through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Good morning. This morning we have two hymns back to back. If you'll turn in your hymnal to page 9 and 10. The first one, Glorify Thy Name, we will sing all three verses and then we go straight into number 10, Majesty.
stand with me as we pray. Indeed, your name is majesty, and we do glorify you in our worship here, O gracious God. And Father, as we come into your presence, we come confessing our sins. May each of us, in the quietness of the moment, plead before your cross those things that have kept us from you. Lord, we have been given such a great and wonderful gift in the salvation of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so, O oh Father, as we come this morning, we plead before you those things that we have failed to do that we should have done, and those things that we have done that we should not have done. Father, cleanse our hearts where we have worshipped other things other than you, that we have made greater priorities, the priorities of fun, the priorities of this world, over the love and worship of our great God and King. Father, the things that you have created for us that are good, we have made often into idols. Forgive us, O Lord. Wash us in the blood of Christ, for you have promise to forgive us our sins when we confess them in repentance before you. And so, Father, we live in the assurance of that pardon, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. turn in the back of your hymnals, you'll find the Nicene Creed, that creed that we confess each communion Sunday, a creed that speaks to the very nature of Christ. Good Christian, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate also for us under Pontius Pilate. Be seated. Bifocals do it every time. Our Old Testament reading this morning, I'll be reading uh, Psalms, Psalm 150. Let everything praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our next hymn, uh, 592, if you'll stand with me and sing 592, Jesus Calls. Our New Testament reading this morning, I'll be reading from John 20, verses 19 through 31. Jesus appears to the disciples. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them in his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. <clears throat> now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. Thank you, Johnny. As we come to our uh, prayer time, a um, couple, one name that didn't get on there uh, because we had already printed the bulletin and one that is added uh, for you to take note on in your bulletin, uh, Brenda Haddon, a uh, friend of Mike and Barbara Kofers, and um, our good friends that none of y'all know, but Karen Lewis, uh, Kay uh, Hanson, they live in uh, Wisconsin, and they are faithful uh, supporters in terms of watching us uh, on Facebook. So we are in a home in Wisconsin uh, every week, and um, she needs us to be in prayer for her, so let's be in prayer for them uh, today as well. Let's go to the Lord in time of prayer. Father God, as we come this morning lifting up before you the cares of our hearts, O oh Father, we would pray and ask that you would hear the cries of our own hearts. We pray for our folks that uh, are on our list our shut-ins, our those that are sick and have other needs, some battling disease, some struggling with effects of old age. Father, for those who are struggling with depression and other issues of the mind, for the church in Ukraine, Lord, we all these things we lift before your throne. Oh God, you have poured out so many blessings to us, and yet we have so much that we cry out to you for. Hear us, O oh Lord. Bring your peace and comfort to those that are hurting. Bring your Love and mercy to those who need salvation. Pour out your Spirit into their hearts that they might be pricked beyond anything they've ever known such that they see their sin and know their need of a Savior, O oh Lord. Father, certainly this month we're praying for all of us, that we might submit to the authority of Your Word. We pray for our country, our community, our local and leaders, our state leaders. Father, protect us. Protect those in law enforcement and first responders. Lord, we're thankful, particularly this morning, for our music ministry and for Greg and Jennifer, and we praise you for the talents that they have. Father, as we come to your table, may we experience your presence. We ask this and the other blessings of our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. As our ushers come forward for our offering, God does indeed love the cheerful giver.
Father, out of your abundance, may we return a portion of what you have stewarded to us. And may you use these gifts for the furtherance of your kingdom here and indeed around the world, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Uh, just a quick note, um, if you, uh, you should have received this week an uh, email uh, concerning uh, our missions Sunday coming up in May. This is May. Uh, coming up in uh, three weeks, four weeks? 22nd of May. Um, and so if you need to finish up your old faith promise and you have the means to do that, uh, please do that before the end of the month. And you will uh, be getting uh, cards in the mail for uh, that mission Sunday as well. If you'll be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, we will finish up uh, chapter 8 this morning. Uh, I'll be reading from verse 23 to verse 34. Let's stand as we do each week in honor of God's amazing Word, a light to our path, a lamp for our feet. Hear the word of the Lord, beginning in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he, that is Jesus, was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And then he rose and rebuked the wind and the seas. There was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea Obey him. And when he came to the other side in the country of the Gerizines, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time. Now a herd of pigs was feeding at some distance from them. The demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into that herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. And they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled and Going into the city, they told everything, especially what happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this your word. But may we see no man save Christ alone, for we ask it in His name. Amen. Amen. When was the last time you were absolutely amazed at something. When was the last time you experienced something that, that flat took your breath away? Something that left you speechless? We're not often amazed anymore at much of anything, are we? 
I remember as a very young man um, sitting three feet in front of my grandfather's TV, because he had one, watching the moon landing. With my grandmother constantly telling me to back up from the TV that the radiation would kill me. And being absolutely amazed to watch the lunar landing and subsequently Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. I was absolutely amazed at that. Well, now, nothing much amazes us. Our cell phones, I'd pull mine out if I had it with me, our cell phones have more computer power in that cell phone than all the computers that were used to send those men to the moon. Technology jumps every moment of every day. When you buy a computer, the time you walk out of wherever you buy it from, it's obsolete. There's a new and bigger and better and faster one coming out the back stockroom door as you walk out the front door with your brand new computer. 24-hour news cycle, instant worldwide communication, TV signals beamed off of satellites. Nothing amazes us anymore, does it? Well, unfortunately, uh, that can be said for Christianity and the church in North America, I believe. Although, I must say, this week I got a text from a member of our church and that text simply read, wow, this prayer thing really works. I loved it, right? Somebody was still amazed that prayer still works. Our passage today, uh, two different vignettes that we'll look at, two groups of people uh, who come into contact with Jesus, and both the groups, I want you to see this morning by the time we leave, are absolutely amazed. Now, they're amazed not for the right reasons, or at least their reaction to Jesus is not the reaction that we would want, but they are nonetheless amazed. And our first vignette here, Jesus and his disciples have been together and they need to cross the Sea of Galilee to the other side. Jesus has been momentarily delayed by two would-be disciples. One, as you recall from last week, had not counted the cost not thought through his words that he would follow Jesus wherever he would go. And the other one had not acted quickly enough. He said, I want to follow you, but I got some stuff I need to do first. Jesus, in a way, rebukes both of them. But then we get these words, and it is important that in Jesus talking about the cost of following him that we looked at last week, we get these words in the beginning of our new vignette today that the disciples, at least, were following Jesus. They did follow Him. These men left their families, their jobs, their homes, everything that was familiar to them and went somewhere that they did not know to follow Jesus. They set their important but lesser important priorities aside, stuff that they liked to do, wanted to do, needed to do, they set all that aside because of the pure joy 
of following Jesus. A number of years ago, um, they discovered a boat in Israel buried in the mud on the Sea of Galilee. And when they dug it up and put it back together and preserved it, it was a preserved fishing boat, much like the boat that Jesus would have been in, in fact, dating to Jesus' time. And that boat is about 27 or 28 feet long and 7 or 8 feet wide. You can see it now preserved in a museum there. And that was the kind of boat that is precisely talked about here in this story, that the disciples and Jesus got in this boat, these men who were, some of which were fishermen who knew this lake better than the back of their own hand, and they start across to the region of the Gerizines, a Gentile region. And as they are going along, Jesus, worn out from ministry, worn out from people hounding Him, not for the salvation that He was offering, but for the physical restoration that they could get in His healing, for the food that He could produce for them, their clamoring after Him has just flayed, worn Him out. After all, this is the God man, right? Truly God, truly man, very God, very man. And so he's asleep. Now, some people would say that speaks to the humanity of Jesus, but this is in, he's asleep during a storm, and if you've ever been seasick, no, you know this is more his divinity maybe speaking here. But nonetheless, he's asleep. And the disciples come and clamor for him, cry out to him. This great storm sweeps over the lake. Now remember the Sea of Galilee is 600 feet below sea level, surrounded by hills and mountains and the wind comes off the desert or the wind comes off the Mediterranean and it sweeps down those mountains, gaining stream, steam, and that calm lake can go from calm to chaos in a matter of moments. I've witnessed it myself. And so there Jesus is asleep in the boat, waves crashing over the sides of the boat, swamping, Scripture says, the boat. And the disciples cry out. They're threatened. These fishermen who knew what it was like to be on the lake are nervous and terrified. Now this story finds itself in all three synoptic Gospels. Not only Matthew, but Mark and Luke. And Mark and Luke have... A little bit other details added to it that is supporting to this. And this sea comes up and begins to rock the boat. And the fishermen who are used to these kind of things are terrified. And they go to Jesus and they say, Don't you care that we're going to perish? Well, I think we can all agree this morning that we're glad that the disciples went to Jesus. I mean, what they say to Jesus is the same thing that we all should say to Jesus. We're going to die if, we don't, if you don't do something. In our sins and trespasses, we all are going to spiritually spend eternity in hell without Jesus. We perish in our sins if we don't flee to the cross. So they come. But we see that their biggest problem is not the frailty of their faith, but it's failure in their time of need. 
It's not the quantity of their faith either. Even though it's small at this point, they're still learning who Jesus is. When trouble comes, they lose their anchor. They're afraid of dying and Jesus rebukes them. Oh, men of little faith. One theologian has correctly written this. How many have faith and love enough to forsake all for Christ's sake and to follow Him wherever He goes and yet are full of fears in the hour of the trial? How many have grace enough to turn to Jesus in every trouble, crying, Lord, save us, and yet grace, not grace enough to lie still and believe that in the darkest hour, all is well. That's the kind of faith we're called to have. That in the darkest hour, we can lie still and know that even when we can't see beyond the chaos, all is well. But even the disciples' weak faith and your weak faith and my weak faith is enough for the great power of Christ. Jesus then gets up and after He has rebuked His disciples, He rebukes the wind and the waves. Mark says, He says, Peace, be still! And the sea that was cresting over the sides of the boat becomes its glass. Jesus commands creation, doesn't He? <laughs> and we could say that creation obeys a whole lot better than we do. Our passage says that they marveled at this. What kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Mark adds a detail here that really helps us see what's going on. Mark tells us that when Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves, not only did the disciples marvel at what kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him, Mark said that the disciples were terrified. Do you hear what Mark's saying? These fishermen that knew the, the sea so well and were terrified that they were going to die are more terrified of Jesus and the power that He has. They were amazed and terrified at the God-man as He displayed His glory in commanding creation. My dear friends, we will all come face to face with this judge who even commands creation. And you will either come before him as a child of wrath or a child of grace. For he commands not only the sea and the waves, but commands your soul. Will you stand before Jesus as a child? of His, or will you stand before Him in utter, utter terror? They come face to face with the authority of Jesus. They come face to face with the holiness of the God-man, and they are terrified.
Well, quickly, let's keep going. We see that if the, the boat makes it to the other side. They arrived in this area called the Gerizines and find two demon-possessed men. Now, this area is an area of Gentiles. Christ does much work. If you follow through the Gospels, you find Him in Gentile areas many times. Remember, Gentiles is just a name for anyone who's not an ethnic Jew. And there are these two demon-possessed men. And they're living in the tombs, and they're so powerful that the people won't even go out that way. They won't walk by because these men terrify them. Well, Jesus arrives, and as our passage says, the two demon-possessed men come out to meet Jesus. So we can see just a couple of very brief, and I'm not going to linger on this, we could for a whole sermon, but a couple of things about demons here, which we can take from our passage, and unfortunately today the church so often just ignores. One is demons can possess people. Not only in Jesus' day, but I truly believe today. Secondly, as we'll see, they know their ultimate fate. They have knowledge enough to know what happens at least when Christ returns. They have the power to create chaos and to move from life to life. And we see that Jesus has ultimate authority over them. Praise the Lord. Well, this is a fascinating story. The demons come out and <clears throat> even before the disciples have truly recognized who Jesus is as the true Messiah, the very Son of God, these demons come out and they cry out, having just seen Him, O oh, Son of God, what have you to do with us? They know who Jesus is. Perfectly. They know He's the Son of God. And then, look what they say. Have you come here to torment us before the time? You know what they mean there? See, they know when Jesus returns that they'll be cast into hell. They know that they'll go into torment when Jesus returns. And they're saying, are you here to torment us before you come back? Why are you here now? They're amazed to see Jesus there as they inhabit these two men. Well, they beg to be cast out of these men and into the pigs. Why they went into the pigs, I uh, can't answer that. What I can answer is that Jesus cares more about human, human souls than He does pigs or any other animal. For we are uniquely created in the image of God. And so they rush down the hill, and we visibly see these demons leave these men and go into these pigs, and the pigs kill themselves. But our story is not finished, even though we need to move quickly. The herdsmen of the pigs run into town, and they tell everybody about what happened to them, and the people of the town come out to see this one who has cast out the demons from these men and who has destroyed what Mark tells us is some 2,000 pigs. They're amazed as well. Oh, 
but unfortunately they do not come out to worship this one who commands nature and demons and worship him they come face to face with the holiness of God and they tell him to leave go away from our area so we've seen Jesus authority over illness over nature over demons his power and authority is over all his holiness his own display and it either does one of two things it draws people to him or it repels people away What is coming face to face with Jesus Christ this morning at the table do for you? Are you drawn to His grace and mercy and love, or are you repelled because He calls you to die to self, to live to Him? To sacrifice what you want to do for what you need and ought to do. It's a decision we all make. And what we decide will cast our faith to eternal life in heaven or to perish in hell. My dear friends, the holiness of God beckons you this morning to His table. Come and live in the joy of of His presence and His authority. Amen. Father, bless us now as we come to Your table. Speak to us. Your presence is here in reality. And so, O Lord, we cry out to You. Amen. As I say each time, this is not the table of Louisville Presbyterian Church. This is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for some of you, this will be the first time you've ever come down front for communion. Let me just say that this is the way that our Scottish forefathers did. In olden days, the elders would have interviewed you outside to see if you were worthy to come in and prepared to come in to take communion. And we invite you, if you are, have prepared your heart and mind today, to come to His table. If you have not prepared your heart and mind today, if you have not confessed your sin before the Lord Jesus Christ, if this is not His table for you, then we ask that you simply remain seated. But if you have prepared this morning we would ask that you come when i call you down and we will come in two groups or three depending on how many we need and simply have a seat the elders will start the bread and the cup at one end and pass it to each table and you can pass it down uh, we're still using sealed uh, juice cups uh, so you'll have to undo that um, and rather than putting your cup back into the tray as has been our custom in the past I would ask you just to put your empty cups on the plates here in the middle of each table but come for this is the Lord Jesus Christ table but come only if you are prepared this morning hear the words of the institution of our Lord as they come from the pen of the Apostle Paul for I received from the Lord that which I pass on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me and in the same way after supper he took the cup saying 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. Let's pray. Father God, as we come this morning to your table, as we take the bread which is your body and the cup which is your blood, we pray, O Lord, that your presence would meet us here, that we would sense not only your presence, but sense your favor on us as we feast on your body. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask you to come, whatever group you would like to come in, if you'd like to come first or second, that's fine. Come to the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he broke it, he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am, and you know the where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The same way, after the meal, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till He comes again. this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. Go in the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ and in His grace and mercy.
He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised. And held, we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that was on him brought us peace. By his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and his sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. go in the presence and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in Scripture that after the supper, before they went out, they sang a song. Let's stand as we do each time and open your back of your hymnals to the song of thanksgiving. We'll sing the first and the third verse only of the song of thanksgiving.
Receive now the benediction. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and abide with you always until he comes again and forevermore. Amen. Amen.